Hello everybody, uh, Tony Buckley is my name. I'm the chair of the Customs Knowledge Institute, or CKI. Uh, just a, a word about CKI to introduce it. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization formed by uh, a number of uh, customs practitioners uh, with the idea of uh, promulgating customs knowledge more generally. Uh, we have a grand course, as we call it, which is a 21-module training course, which Enrica will say a little more about at the end of this uh, webinar. We also uh, provide webinars. As, uh, we are embarked on a series of which this is one. Uh, some are free webinars like this one, and some are paid to deal with particular topics. We have a community for exchange of information. And I would invite you to go to our uh, website and to look at the details of the community, which is a discussion forum and also uh, a resource for exchanging views, seeking information, and really anything you want to talk about relating to customs. Uh, we would strongly recommend you to have a look at that. Now, today I am. Uh, I have the honor of making the first presentation in this webinar. And um, I see I have, of course, started at the last slide, which is uh, an occupational hazard, I guess, with presenting. So I'm just going to say a few words for a few minutes about authorization management, specifically uh, authorized economic operator authorization. Um, First of all, the why do why do people apply for AEO? And here on this slide, uh, by the way, all of the slides will be available to you after this uh, webinar, so there's no need to take notes as we go through. Um, this is a list of the benefits of AEO status. Uh, AEOC is um, authorization for the purpose of availing of simplifications only. AEOS is an authorization for safety and security uh, procedures, which obviously affects some industries more than others. And there is a third, which combines both authorizations and is known as AEOF for full authorization. And an AEOF is authorized both for simplifications and for safety and security. Uh, this slide is useful because it indicates the articles of the Union Customs Code or the Union Customs Code Delegated Act, uh, which specify the entitlements of an AEO under the authorization. And here I've given a link which takes you into the full AEO guide on the uh, European Commission website. So when you're in AEO, what happens? Well, you're monitored on an ongoing basis by customs. And as you can see here on the left, immediately after your authorization, the monitoring officer is required to lodge a formal report and a, a formal plan for how he or she proposes to monitor your management of the AEO status. In Ireland, the guideline, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same guideline in every EU uh, member state, so th this is an example. The monitoring officer is required to file a formal report after 12 months. So every 12 months required to, um, uh, well, sorry, after the first 12 months required to file a formal monitoring report. And then every two years after that, another formal report is required. And an on-site visit and a thoroughgoing inspection takes place, and effectively it's an audit um, every three years while you hold an AEO authorization. And the list here is the list of the minimum that the monitoring officer is required to report on at each monitoring intervention. So you can expect regular monitoring. In fact, in practice, it is quite usual for the monitoring officer to visit more or less informally uh, 
uh, on a monthly basis or a bi-monthly basis. This is not unusual at all. So when you're an AEO, the idea is that you're forming a sort of partnership with customs and that the interaction should be regular and frequent. So what gives rise to problems with AEO status? And this is based on my own experience, um, both uh, as a customs official um, and indeed now as an advisor to businesses. So one big failure is failure to maximize the benefits of AEO, failure to realize the benefits. Many, particularly companies that are new to uh, customs or inexperienced, think that when they get an AEO authorization, that's it, they're done, their problems are over. Not so. The authorization opens a door for you, but you need then to maximize the benefit by applying for um, other authorizations, such as warehouse authorization, simplification authorizations. They're all specific authorizations, which are easy to get if you have AEO status, but you need to apply for them to maximize the benefit. Also, Customs is required to give you a special dedicated AEO contact point. Um, in Ireland, it's an email address, which is dedicated to dealing with AEO's queries. In some countries, it's a named officer. And uh, another contact point, of course, should be your monitoring officer. So if you have a problem or if you feel you're not getting the treatment that you should be getting as an AEO, you use this designated contact point. Very important to know what that contact point is or who it is and to use it. Uh, so you build up uh, an understanding and a relationship. That's very important. Also, in the course of achieving your authorization, some risks will be specifically pointed out to you. Very important that you address those risks and that you remain conscious of them. The next failure is, of course, people will take the certificate and say, right, that's, that's fine. I am now an AEO without reading the conditions. Every authorization has conditions attached, which are specific to you and your business. You, you must read those conditions because legally you have to adhere strictly to the conditions specified. If customs has a query, you must respond quickly and fully in order to build trust. Failure to do so can lead to suspicion and bad consequences. Failure to use AEO status on your declarations. The officer at the border who is checking your goods will not know from the declaration that you have AEO status. That would require him or her to go into the custom systems and inquire to find out if you have AEO status. Otherwise, they won't know. So your goods may be subjected to checks which wouldn't apply if the officer was aware of your status. Um, Failure to carry out the procedures that you documented. In getting your authorization, you supplied customs with very nice written procedures. Be sure that you implement those procedures and keep a record of their implementation. If you adopt because you're AEO and you adopt a casual approach to declarations saying, you know, that's good enough, it's near enough, then Customs will come to associate errors and regular errors with your practice, and that again creates doubt. If there are changes, changes of personnel, uh, changes of procedures, you must inform customs. If you if you fail to do so, and they later discover that changes have been made without notification, again that is a breach of your conditions. And adopting shortcuts that are not authorized. In other words, assuming that the AEO authorization authorizes you to do other things when in fact it doesn't, that leads to serious problems. What are the consequences of problems then? What are the penalties as it were? Well, suspension or removal of authorization is specified in the Union Customs Code, but in fact, it, 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 that's quite rare uh, because it's a very serious sanction. It does happen, but it's quite rare. What is more common is that in practice, 
the the improved risk rating, the lower level of checks and the, the lower frequency of checks may be lost. In other words, the customs in practice, if they detect one shipment with an error, they will then check more of your shipments, regardless of your AEO status. Um, so you will lose a large part of the benefit. Simplifications, which are separately authorized, they may be limited or removed or simply not renewed because simplification authorizations are usually for a period of a year or three years. And when they come up for renewal, customs may refuse to renew them. You would have an increased level of monitoring you may effectively find yourself with a customs officer setting up camp on your site to monitor closely if there, if customs deems that that is necessary. You may find when you need customs cooperation that it's just not forthcoming, that they are unable to accommodate your requirements. So overall, the benefits of AEO status may be substantially lost and you may be treated as a high-risk case just through some of the failures that I outlined earlier. Okay, um, I'm going to come to an end there. I should have mentioned in the beginning that you will see the chat and Q&A on your screen. You can, um, and Vlad has posted the link to the CKI website, which I urge you to to use and learn about us. If you have any questions, uh, you may ask them in the chat or Q&A, or indeed uh, you may, well, uh, I'm afraid that's the access you have, is to use the chat or the Q&A. And I will stay here for a couple of minutes in case there are any questions. And while I'm waiting, I will tell you about uh, a one-hour webinar, which I am giving on the 12th of October, about interpreting EU law. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, it's something that many people find intimidating, this idea of uh, approaching a big uh, book like the, um, the Consolidated uh, Customs Code. You know, it, uh, it, it intimidates quite a lot of people. And this webinar is intended to demystify it a little bit and to encourage you to actually go to the original law to find what the accurate legal provisions are that apply to whatever problem it is you're trying to uh, solve. Okay, I don't see any questions coming in. So at that, I will hand over to Enrica who is going to talk to you about some of the problems that occur with transit. And of course, I remain here to answer any questions in the chat that you may have on what I have said. So I leave it at that. Thank you very much, Enrica. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, but Tonya, now Annette will speak about export and I will close the webinar. I will speak at the end. So Annette, please, your turn. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about export controls. I know export controls and sanctions are not customs. So this is a little bit out of the box. Um, but as we all know, this is very, very, very actual at the moment. Um, and it is customs related usually. So um, I think it makes totally sense to talk about it. And it is also, uh, how I can this way. Yeah, so it's also part of our um, customs clearance and trade compliance course, uh, which I really recommend. And this is the module export control and sanctions I'm referring to today. And uh, yeah, today we will only get a little bit a glimpse of it, what it is. And, and as you might, um, uh, well, might already know, it's much more complicated as to do it in 10 minutes. But I try my best. Um, so let's start about what is, I have to put this on my screen here, sorry. Yeah, so let's start with, um, I think it's always the most important thing at the beginning is always to understand what we are talking about, what it is. And I'm looking here from a um, from point of the European Union. And the basic 
idea for, from the European Union, and actually not only the European Union, also a lot of other countries around the world, they have the basic idea of the freedom of foreign trade. So you can do foreign trade as much as you want. But, <laughs> of course, there's always a but. Um, it can be restricted for some reason. But I think it's very important to understand that the basic idea is freedom of foreign trade. Because if we have this basic idea about the freedom, then you always need a reason to restrict it. And this is, is a very important idea of the uh, export controls and sanctions in the European Union. So what is the ambition? Here we start with the ambition. And I have to say, three years ago, when I did these lessons, these courses, everybody was yeah, quite a little bit laughing and saying, yeah, yeah, OK, wonderful ambitions. International human rights, international peace, national security, and comply with international agreements. And we've seen over the course of the last three years, and at least over the uh, uh, course of the last half year, how important these ambitions are and what happens. Somehow we, we took them for granted. And uh, we learned in the last years that this is not granted. We have to work for it. And this is part of export controls. <laughs> so the, what is, the question is first, what is the threat to these uh, ambitions? And for years and years, it was weapons of mass destructions, the so ABC weapons, which is atomic, biological, and chemical weapons. There are regional conflicts and their terrorism. So these are the, the most important threats to these ambitions. This is what mostly the, the point is here. And the idea is to protect to protect the, uh, the ambition against these threats. And this um, to protect this, the idea was in, in the last century to control movement of items. And you see here the word item is not the word good, <laughs> because this is not only about goods, it's items, and there include also um, tech, uh, techniques and, uh, and, and software. So it's that, that's also a different to customs. It's about services, or oh, there is missing an R, and it's about financial transactions. So to control these uh, kind of things, the idea is to protect these um, these values, this ambition we have, and how to do it? The measures are license requirements and prohibitions, and this is and that's very very for me it's impressive because this is not the um, the idea human beings are working. This is preventive, which means we want to make sure that these values are protected and not only act when they are in threat. And after they're well, they're, they're, they're not longer there or they're in, um, in trouble. So this is a, the idea of export control in the European Union. And actually, uh, that's a global idea of all the countries who are working together on this. It's to prevent um, that the threats coming to action against the ambitions. And therefore, we need licenses and there are prohibitions um, if we want to move items, services, or financial transactions. And then we have this red line here, and it is a red line. Whenever somebody, usually a country, but in case of terrorism, also a people, um, are um, going over this red line, um, then there will be a reaction. And here we're coming to reactive um, measures, and these are the embargoes and sanctions. But very important, and that's why we come back to the freedom of foreign trade again on the top and on the bottom. Civil transactions shall not be disrupted. Only transactions with our security set must be prevented. So this is the basic idea, again, coming back to the freedom of foreign trade, but this might be um, uh, um, restricted because we need to protect our ambitions. And we've seen at quite at the moment how important this is. And actually to act preventive and not only reactive. So this is the idea of export control. So it, it is export control and sanctions are included because the sanctions, and this is not punishment. It's very important to understand. The embargoes and sanctions there are to make sure that, for example, if a country does not comply with international agreements, that they are coming back to the table and they comply again. So it's not to punish. Punishment is usually afterwards 
like giving somebody a punishment, but this is to try to to um, to make somebody to come back. Okay, so how is this? So how I'm going further? Yeah. So very briefly um, about um, how this is set up um, with with the legal. <laughs> You're coming to uh, to the point. Also, always look into uh, the, the the legal requirements. Um, and I said we have an international an international um, setup, and then we have um, this converted into EU law. And first of all, again, we have the pre preventive measures here. This is the normal export control situation every com every company faces because we want to know. Well, not not me, not we, <laughs> but the, uh, the 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 countries the the um, uh, um, want to know how some goods are um, moving around in the world. So to to see if some goods going too much in one direction, that you can have a step in preventive before it's too late. And therefore, we have these listed item. These are the, the lists we have, and they're done internationally. So every country has their lists, but usually they're based on international agreements and so-called regimes. So we have ABC agreements, internationally, atomic, biological, and chemical. And then we have the so-called regimes. And I have to say, not all countries are taking part on these regimes. You always have to look which regime, which countries um, are, um, are in there. Um, but we have four different regimes, and they usually we have physical chemicals and, and people like that, and they say these are goods. Um, we need to know how they uh, move around the world to see um, in advance if something maybe badly happens. Um, so, for example, a lot of goods you can use. You need to new to to build an, an atomic bomb is uh, going in a certain country, then you know, okay, we need to have a look there. And this is all, export control is all about looking, have a look what happens. It's not of, of restriction, it's just of knowing, and therefore we have these license requirements. And this is set up into the EU law, but actually in the EU, in export control, this is a little bit different to customs, because we do not have a common customs or a common export control law. Um, we have the, the common foreign security policy, but most of the regulations need to be transformed uh, into, um, uh, well, will be transformed into national law. But there is a little bit of um, a concurrence between EU law and, um, and member state law. Why is it? Because if the EU has taken action for something, um, the, the, the most uh, and knowing what the most people know is about the dual use goods here, the EU has taken action, so the member states do not need to have actions anymore. But if there is um, a hole somehow, so member states can still um, put their interest in here. So basically, basically, it's divided into three uh, things. We have the raw materials. That's usually, um, well, that's the tanks, the, the aircraft and all these things, and that national. Uh, so every country has a national list on these materials, and every country decides on what, where they are going to and where they are sending these materials to. And then we have a military, a common military goods list, and this is based on the Vassina arrangement. And this is an EU list, but this is had had to be transferred into uh, into member state law. So every member state has its own list here, but this is mostly one to one. The EU list, and this is one to one, the Vassina arrangement list. And here we have military goods. Okay, the writing is a little bit strange. I translated it from German. <laughs> and, uh, but these are parts and components, and not what it's uh, the finished ones who are on the raw material list, and mostly especially um, designed or, or um, uh, construed for um, military purposes. And then we have the big, uh, the big uh, point about the dual use goods, where every company somehow has to deal with, and these are the goods you can use for civil purposes and for military purposes. 
now if you basically if you can you can say everything you can use for military purposes also my pen here you can use it for military purposes and for civil purposes so it's dual use but this is a list where the goods we want to know where they are in the world are listed so the dual use, dual use goods list is a list of goods it's the same as here it's all listed goods here we have control listed items we have a few more we have the the dual use list we have uh, um, a few more here for torture um, stuffs and for firearm stuff and additionally there might be always a national list as well and secondly a catch-all which means um, it's not listed it's a still it's dual use as i said everything is dual use it's not listed but because of the purpose in the land the country where it's going to it might be controls so the most important thing always, you can break it down usually for what am I going to export and what means is it listed. It's always listed at the beginning. Whenever you do export control, you need to know what are you doing. Then for what reason? This is here catch-all. Where is it going? Same here catch-all. And to whom? And now we are going, coming here to the reactive, to the sanctions and embargoes. And here we also, we have pretty much the same. We have um, international, usually international sanctions from the United Nations or the OCE. But well, very, very recently, I think everybody is aware the EU has its own um, sanctions and uh, I'm here for a good reason, because the United Nations and the OCE, they cannot um, issue these um, embargoes uh, against Russia because Russia is in the Security Council and is a member of the OSCE and can block everything. So the EU took, as a lot of other countries took their own actions here, but mostly um, the embargoes and sanctions are based on the United Nations or on the OSCE. And this might um, surprise some of you. We have currently nearly 30 sanctions or embargoes in place. Um, um, we are all talking about Russia, we are all talking about Iran, but there are currently nearly 30 uh, sanctions in place. Why don't we talk that much on this? Well, in the last years, um, very luckily, most of these sanctions are financial sanctions. It means they're against persons and not so much against countries. Even so, those who are against countries um, have mostly a list of persons who are sanctions. And we see that with the Russian embargo um, uh, at the moment as well. There is a, a long list and a always increasing list about persons who are sanctioned. So it's more financial. The Russian one is more, that's much more comprehensive. But um, again, we currently have nearly 30 um, sanctions in place. And they are mostly open countries, but also a few that's the terrorist list, the so called against persons itself, which is only since the beginning of this um, century that we have that we have didn't have that in the past. So this is very briefly so why I said here you need to know these we always say these four WV words what for what where and to whom you're sending um, the, the the goods or as I said it's item so it's technology technology and software as well it's not only goods. And then this is, is the basis to know, um, to implement this into your company, into the, the organization. And actually, because the, the sanctions are usually based on the export control. If you have a good export control organization, then it might be if, if a sanction comes in place, which is very immediate. So you can't really prepare for it. But if your company is prepared because you have a really good export control, um, uh, uh, organization in place, then it makes it easier to deal with this because all the sanctions usually they have items, services, and financial measures. It's the same as it's here. So um, first thing always is um, to have an export control organization, and then it makes easier for sanctions. Even so, as I said, sanctions coming immediate, not that immediate. If you are looking around the world, you mostly see it coming. Um, it's not as a law. A law needs three years or so to implement and sanctions coming very fast. And there's a lot of politics in it. But however, um, this is um, a bit more with confident if you are um, if, if you have an organization here. 
If you want to learn more about export control, <laughs> please join our course, uh, the custom Grid to take compliance training. Um, and we will have um, quite some more on export controls in that as well. And with that, I take give over to Yevgeny and Anouk. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. This was really interesting. Um, we're going to speak about responsibilities. Do I have to remove uh, that? Oh, no, I'll, I'll take care of it. <laughs> OK, good. So we'll talk about uh, the custom representative uh, responsibilities. So here, this is a scheme of the uh, different kind of uh, litigations that a uh, customs representative can have. Uh, on the left, you have the uh, litigations linked to uh, the responsibility toward administration. And on the right, you have the one with the responsibility toward the clients of the uh, customs representative. So we are first focused on the responsibility toward administration with the custom debts and the VAT. Then we'll focus on the responsibility toward the clients. Mm, this will be short uh, as uh, the two presentations before because we only have 15 minutes. But as uh, Anthony and Annette, uh, if you want to know more about this subject, you can uh, go on the fourth course. Uh, that will uh, be on sale uh, on the web on the website. So about about uh, re custom representative, uh, you have uh, responsibility toward uh, custom representative. You have uh, three actors. You have the economic operator, which is the client, and you have the custom administ administration. The question is, um, what? who is responsible for what? You have custom duties, V80, you have con compensable uh, injuries and the mandate expense. The, the economic operator is a person who is doing business under custom leg legislations, but um, as you probably already know, the custom legislation is very complicated and the economic operator uh, would probably like to delegate uh, all his obligations to someone who is uh, very comp uh, knowledgeable in this uh, formalities, for example. And this person is a customs representative who is someone uh, linked by a mandate with his client. This representation can be direct or indirect. And uh, for the direct representation, the custom representative is uh, working in the name of his client. And for the indirect representation, the custom representative is working is in his name, in his own name, sorry. So the question is, who is responsible for what? Because if the custom representative is working under his name, it may make him responsible for some uh, formalities. This question, uh, was asked uh, in, a, in front of the European Court of Justice, who answered that the custom debt, which is an amount of import or export duty, which applies to specific goods under the custom legislation, uh, is, uh, the, is an amount that the declarant should uh, pay and the declarant is the debtor, in a, according to the Article 77. As you can see, the declarant shall be the debtor in the event of indirect representation. The person on whose behalf the custom declaration is made shall also be a debtor. So the declarant is the person who is doing the declaration on his name. As I said, there is direct representation and indirect representation. So if you're doing uh, the declaration under the direct representation, this is the name of the client who will be on it. 
on if you're doing it under the indirect representation, this will be the customs representative's name. The Article 84 says that if there is um, if there is two people uh, liable for the custom debt, this is a, a jointly and severally li liability. So, so we have two different responsibilities working: the one with the indirect representation and the one with the direct representation. As you can see here, on the right, we have the direct representation scheme. On, on, the, no, on the left, on, on the right, you have the indirect representation scheme. The question was in uh, the case I, I'm, I, I'm going to talk about was uh, who is liable for the VAT? Because as I said, uh, the uh, customs debt is uh, something that the debtor should pay. But uh, in the case of the indirect representation scheme, there is two person liable for the custom debt. So is the VAT uh, following the, the custom debt uh, regime or not? The European Court of Justice said that uh, we couldn't answer uh, at this question under the custom code uh, re regulation because uh, the custom code regulation was only talk uh, talking about the uh, the customs uh, debt and not for the VAT. So then the uh, the question was, what about VAT uh, uh, regarding to the VAT directive? Um, the European Court of Justice said that the VAT directive uh, says that the VAT is uh, something that's only uh, that the person who is designed to be the debtor uh, from the, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I just have an issue with my computer. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so the VAT, uh, the one who is liable for the VAT is, uh, I'm really sorry for this issue. I have to, okay. Okay, good. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm lost. Okay, so um, the European Court of Justice said that the VAT was, uh, the, the one who was liable for the VAT was uh, the one that the national law said uh, he was liable for that. But the question, the main question now is about the duty of advice, because as you may see on this scheme, on this scheme, uh, there is a responsibility toward administration, but also responsibility toward the client. So the responsibility toward the client is almost a question of a duty of advice. And then here you can see all the things as a custom representative, you should uh, uh, take, uh, uh, you should uh, take care of. And this is, for example, to verify uh, the consistency and the sufficiency of the information provided by the client. And uh, this is because the client can give you information that he thinks is very important for you uh, in order to do the declaration. But uh, maybe you as a, a re registered customer uh, representative, you, you know that this information is not important. Uh, on, on the other hand, he can uh, uh, forget to give you information that is, uh, that is very, uh, 
he can give you information. Uh, he can forget to give you information that uh, is very important for you for the declaration, and he he doesn't give it to you because he doesn't know that this is important. So uh, never forget to ask uh, additional information if you need it, because uh, you you will engage your responsibility if you don't, and always keep the proof that you asked for it because if you don't uh, you'll be uh, judged like uh, if you didn't ask this information so you should also ask for uh, information uh, you, you should also inform your custom your client that uh, there is consequences uh, for the choose of the of the regime of the goods that he's uh, uh, imported or exported. And uh, you should uh, also uh, advise your client after the start of the project, because uh, he, you, you are a knowledgeable person. You should uh, uh, take care of the import importation. And uh, if you don't, as I said, your respons responsibility will be engaged. So the, you can ask for written information. Uh, uh, you can uh, write about information about uh, actions that can be taken. In the case of uh, the administration is asking lo your client uh, 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 customs um, duties and uh, things that uh, he, he, did, he wasn't aware of. So, now I'm going to leave the Enrica uh, exposing her subject. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Arnold. So the case is really very important, and uh, I still remember here in Lithuania, indirect representatives uh, who are usually or, or mostly the express carriers were uh, quite happy because in Lithuania we don't have the liability set out in the national law that indirect representative shall be liable also for VAT debt. So it's quite a good condition here. So uh, thank you very much. I will share my slides on customs transit risk. Mm -hmm. I will set up also from the first slide. Don't know why there are. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about um, uh, transit and customs warehousing risks and in more general about the holders of customs procedures and their costly mistakes. Uh, this topic uh, is kind of my topic from my practical experience as a customs broker and also I prepared the discharge lesson of transit module of customs clearance and trade compliance in the EU training. Uh, therefore, any information about proper discharge or issues related to that is uh, very interesting to me. Uh, we will talk about, as I mentioned, two holders uh, of uh, holders of two types of procedures. One of the transit procedure, the holder of the procedure issues is usually the holder of authorization of comprehensive guarantee and the uh, holder of customs warehousing procedure. Uh, and we will focus on one quite common issue when something happens to the goods uh, when they are under the special customs procedure. Uh, and analyzing case law, I came to the conclusion that uh, the guiding principle when there is dispute um, between customs and between business regarding the issue, uh, that the dispute is resolved uh, based on this principle that if there is a possibility that goods have entered the market, the holder of the procedure will be asked to pay import duties and taxes. So uh, a possibility that goods have entered the market. So no matter what, and uh, what do I mean with that? No matter what, I would like to illustrate providing you two examples. Uh, the one uh, example is about transit uh, and uh, about uh, transit procedure and the case was uh, 
the clarification was given by the European Court of Justice, and the situation was that the goods were transported, um, uh, it, it was liquid cargo, uh, was transported via rail and under transit procedure, and it happened so that two tons of, of this cargo leaked due to technical issue. Uh, and and when the uh, shipment arrived, customs detected the issue and asked to pay the import duties and taxes. However, the holder of transit procedure disagreed. Uh, the holder said that this is irretrievable loss. So the dispute arose. It couldn't be solved by national courts. And uh, the clarification was, uh, European Court of Justice was asked to provide clarification. Uh, what did the court said? The court uh, said that uh, unfortunately it is not clear where those goods are, where they disappeared. Most probably uh, it is the possibility that they have entered the market and therefore the holder of the transit procedure has to pay. Uh, the second example is about customs warehouse. Um, and uh, this customs warehouse faced an armed robbery, even with hostage take, taking, and uh, the uh, jewelry was stolen. Uh, uh, customs again said, uh, so the goods entered the market, uh, and you have to pay, you, the customs warehouse, have to pay customs debt the duty and VT. The customs warehouse disagreed, said this is a force majeure condition and, uh, and not uh, subject to payment of customs duties and taxes. So the dispute again went to, through national courts and reached the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice again clarified that the customs warehouse uh, is, uh, has to pay the customs debt because the goods entered the market. Um, if you would wish to um, uh, learn more in detail about those cases, you can go under the links, you will find videos. Uh, so uh, one additional remark, we discussed that uh, it's important that the, the possibility that the goods enter the market. And another point is that the holder of the customs procedure Pace, not the owner of the goods. So customs is not uh, concerned about ownership at all. Uh, sometimes there are really interesting situations when it is not clear which holder has to pay because as you know, transit procedure can be discharged by customs warehousing procedure and vice versa, customs warehousing procedure can be ended by transit procedure. And we will take a look at uh, several examples also from case law and uh, how they were resolved, who had to pay the amounts. So the situation one, vodka was in bottles was transported under T1 procedure to a customs warehouse. Uh, when the cargo arrived to customs, uh, customs office of destination, uh, customs checked uh, the cargo, the seals were intact, the loading department was not damaged, so customs said, all is fine, and uh, customs cleared the goods under customs warehousing procedure. When the truck came to the customs warehouse and the goods were unloaded, customs warehouse checked, so quantities matched, matched no discrepancies, and made records accordingly. Uh, one day, customs audit came to that customs warehouse. Uh, and they took samples of the vodka in bottles and sent them to the customs laboratory. Uh, and here the answer from customs laboratory came. A wonder happened. Uh, there was water instead of vodka in the bottles. Uh, the holder of the procedure had to pay more than 300,000 euros. Uh, however, the holder of customs warehousing procedure disagreed because the customs warehouse is not obliged to test every good that it accepts into the customs warehouse. Uh, and in the opinion of the customs warehousing procedure holder, uh, the holder of the transit procedure is responsible. So again, the dispute went through national courts and reached the uh, Supreme Administrative Court of Lithuania. And let's think for yourself um, how the court clarified the situation. 
who had to pay this uh, huge amount, more than 300,000 euros, which holder? And I will provide you an answer. So the uh, um, court clarified that the customs warehouse accepting the goods for storage assumes the related responsibilities and bears the non-compliance risk. Such an interpretation is also consistent with the practice of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So customs warehouse had to pay. If you want to learn more details about this case, you see the link to an article on the slide. So the second situation, uh, also uh, from the courts, um, customs warehouse loaded 15,000 pieces of goods into the truck uh, and under T1 procedure, the, the goods were transported to the customs office of destination. Customs office of destination found that the seals are intact, loading department not damaged, however, 1,000 pieces of goods are missing, so only 14,000 were mm, delivered to the customs office. Uh, again, the dispute arose, who has to pay in this situation, the holder of the transit procedure or the holder of the customs warehousing procedure? Again, think for a second for yourself, who you think uh, should pay. And here, what the court has clarified, the court has clarified that there are no signs that something could have happened during transit procedure. Obviously, the customs warehouse didn't load the right quantity of goods, though the records show 15 pieces in and the same quantity out. So, customs warehouse had to pay in this situation. Again, customs warehouse. In both situations, we have a similar result for the customs warehouses. So what were the mistakes and how they could be prevented? What can we learn from those situations? Um, situation, uh, first situation uh, is, uh, can, can teach everybody, every holder of a special procedure. Uh, that to check the reliability of customers is very important as obviously uh, the customs warehouse accepted the goods relying on the customers saying what those goods are. So don't rely, always check. And second situation is specific to customs warehouses and to the most sensitive uh, point or most sensitive moment in the customs warehousing procedure, the moment of receipt of goods. So uh, every customs warehouse should uh, check the processes, put the right processes in this place and focus because a mistake in the receipt can result in mistakes further in the process and even in subsequent procedures. Uh, so much of my 10 minutes presentation. Uh, I would like to invite you uh, to, uh, to invite those who are interested in transit, in transit risk management, to explore this topic a little bit deeper with me on 5th October in the webinar. So if you are interested, uh, I invite you to register. And for those who really need to understand customs clearance and who really need to understand what are the customs compliance and trade compliance issues and how to manage them. I think it's the best time to start the customs clearance and trade compliance course is today because today and tomorrow uh, special rates, special price applies as early bird offers. So uh, you are invited to check out and thank you, stay compliant and good luck in managing risks. If any questions, I would be happy to respond to them as all the lecturers. I don't see any questions. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I hope that we can invite you in the future webinars, free webinars as well. And I hope you take, took away some ideas or useful tips. And thank you to the speakers as well and see you in future webinars. Thank you, bye-bye.